Isaac Asimov's Rare Earth Hypothesis. Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee published Rare Earth in 2000. At the time, the idea that despite the billions of stars in a galaxy, Earth's and technological civilizations could be rare was new. But I actually grew up having read Isaac Asimov's Extraterrestrial Civilizations. Ward and Brownlee don't reference Isaac's book. I wanted to reread Isaac's book and Rare Earth in the light of a recent finding furthering the Rare Earth Hypothesis. Appears that supernova don't all produce the same amount of phosphorus. Phosphorus is an essential element for life as we know it. I'll link one article here. Phosphorus shortage may make alien life very rare. This finding is just the latest property of our solar system and Earth that astronomers have found, which would indicate that Earth's and extraterrestrial civilizations might be rare. As indicated above, Isaac Asimov, and not Ward or Brownlee, was the first to think of this rare Earth hypothesis. Curiously, he doesn't mention Fermi's paradox. So, I'll start this review of the rare Earth hypothesis with Fermi's paradox. In the 1950s, Fermi was sitting down with a few physicist friends talking about the recent Big Bang theory of the universe. Note, this was over a decade before even cosmologists took the Big Bang seriously, and asked, where are they? What he was getting at is if there was a Big Bang 10 to 20 billion years ago, the Big Bang is well dated in today's Hubble Space Telescope era at 13.7 billion years, and the Earth is dated to 4.5 billion years old, then shouldn't there be ETs swarming the galaxy? Shouldn't the galaxy be settled by now? A further technicality of the Fermi paradox is that for there to be rocky planets, you need a generation or two of supernova. The Big Bang only produces hydrogen and helium, elements essential to making stars but not rocky planets. Supernova go off in about 100 million years. Factor in the recombination event after the Big Bang, when the universe cooled down enough for light to disentangle from electrons and allow atoms to appear, and you still have billions of years since the Big Bang for ETs to swarm the universe. UFO and ET enthusiasts have of course had a field day with this one. They've hypothesized everything from there among us, the Einstein was an alien hypothesis, to making the Egyptian pyramids to just getting ready to wipe us out, getting to Isaac Asimov's rare earth hypothesis. Isaac Asimov gets to his rare earth hypothesis by means of rational philosophy. He points out the remarkable similarity between the UFO craze and religions who want there to be a god to save them. Whereas the god believers want a savior god Jesus or Osiris or Dionysius or Mithras, see my gospel of truth, the UFO guys want ETs to come down to earth and reveal all their science and technology so we don't have to go through the painful stages of life to acquire all this knowledge. One could further note the analogy with the third world economies being able to go straight to the information age instead of the industrial age, as pointed out by Alvin Toffler. This proves some interesting ideas of Carnap and other Vienna school of logicians of the 1900s, that often a problem can be proven meaningless, or other times a problem is meaningless at one time and not at another time. This understanding appears to have been lost to humanity since E.T. Bell's development of mathematics, which appears to me heavily influenced by this Vienna logician's scientific humanist philosophy. The idea of extraterrestrial civilizations has no meaning before astronomers prove the heliocentric model of the solar system, they'll often say of the universe, or heliocosmology. In a geocentric model of the universe where the white dots are not suns, there's no way to conceive of extraterrestrials. Also, this relates to the nature of all mathematical discovery. A mathematical problem is hard because the viewpoint one is using is not appropriate for its solution. Only by re-expression does a hard mathematical problem get solved. In symbolic logic, one learns that to prove a proposition from the conclusion, one needs to make a re-expression. See perhaps Velleman's How to Prove It. Isaac points out that the effort to find extraterrestrial intelligence by hypothesizing a god, Oz, is using unobservables, and since we can't disprove unobservables, we move on to looking for extraterrestrials like us. He points out animals as intelligences, 
but since they don't create technologies, they don't count. And this shows that when we're looking for extraterrestrial intelligences, we're looking for extraterrestrial civilizations. Curiously to me perhaps he missed pointing out Neanderthals as intelligences other than ourselves. And there were lots of other primates other than Australopithecines and Homo erectus that we competed with in our evolution. But getting to the rare earth hypothesis, Despite Isaac considering the moon not that important to the possibility of extraterrestrial civilizations, or E.C. quote, S, for short, he starts there. Isaac points out Torricelli's experiment which found the vacuum for the first time. Astronomers quickly realize that the atmosphere of the Earth does not extend throughout space and maybe the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. No atmosphere, no water, no life. Isaac then goes through all the physics discoveries and history, showing there's no life on Venus or Mars, probably not. Certainly we know there's no multicellular life on Mars, the gas giants and their moons. Just because only one planet in our solar system is covered with life, doesn't mean other star systems are not brimming with life. But Isaac finds many astronomy findings suggesting that Earths may be rare. Isaac's first number for habitable star systems is 300 billion. Isaac goes through some rather little-known history of the nebular hypothesis, he shows that Laplace's nebula hypothesis for the origin of a star and planets went through a bit of a scientific process. Laplace's nebula hypothesis had an angular momentum problem, the sun doesn't rotate fast, but the planets do. It took over a hundred years before astronomers realized magnetic fields could have transferred the momentum from the sun to the planets. I've considerably shortened all the history presented in Isaac's book. Isaac tries to use this to exclude certain star systems from having planets, fast rotators must not have planets. He does point out there could be other reasons, but for the most part, this condition reduces the amount of habitable planets for Isaac's second number, 280 billion. I'm just going to list out for the most part Asimov's numbers for habitable solar systems. Third figure is 75 billion. This is due to stars being too large, they go supernova, and small stars doing tidal locking flare stars. These midget stars make up the majority of stars. Sun-like stars are only 25% of the stars in a galaxy. What happens when binary stars are taken into account? Fourth figure is 52 billion. This figure is arrived at by considerations of binary star systems. The explanation gets a bit complex as he considers every possibility of giant and small stars in a binary system. Fifth figure is 5.2 billion. The possibility of extraterrestrial civilizations takes a big hit with considerations of population 1 and 2 stars. These labelings are a bit backwards for most people, including me. The galactic core stars are called population 2 stars, and the disk stars are population 1 stars. The population 2 stars are light element stars and probably don't have any heavy element planets. They're also radiated by the central black hole. There's also the consideration of generation 2 stars of the population 1 stars. In all, the number of stars with the possibilities of an Earth-like planet takes a big hit. Sixth figure is 2.6 billion. Isaac's sixth figure is probably the most speculative at the time of his writing. I'm thinking that one article I read about Jupiter's spiraling in close to their star and ejecting any inner rocky planets also holds here. I need to reread that. Those close-in Jupiters would drastically reduce the number of stars with Earth-like planets. Seventh figure is 1.3 billion. Isaac arrives at this figure by considering that not all planets in a suitable star system's ecosphere are of the right size. 8th figure is 650 million. This figure has come about with the same considerations as the 7th figure, so these two figures are not precise. I'm thinking this is where the Rare Earth book comes in to define these parameters more precisely. 9th figure is 600 million. This figure is a guesstimate on the lifetimes that life develops from bacteria to multicellular. It's saying if a star is stable enough and has been around for enough time for life to go from single cell to multicellular. This uses the Cambrian explosion as a minimum time when life went multicellular. And the tenth figure is related to this consideration. 433 million, also figure 11 which is considering land life, 416 million. And the twelfth figure is about how many star systems planets could be around with intelligent civilizations, 390 million. Isaac's last figure, 13, is 530,000. What does Ward Brownlee show that's new beyond Isaac Asimov's 1980s book? They talk about plate tectonics and snowball earth. The snowball earth may be related to the moon stabilizing the earth's tilt, 
this would be when the moon wasn't in position to stabilize the Earth's tilt as much. Also, they mention the moon and Jupiter. Astronomers have found that many solar systems' Jovian planets have spiraled close in where the inner rocky planets would be. Because of a resonance between the star and its Jovian planets, as the Jovian planet spiraled in, the resonance would have thrown out any inner rocky planets. Between the moon, which Isaac disregards, and the Jovian planets being in close, and the recent supernovas not making phosphorus equally, that last thirteenth number is probably considerably lower. Probably less than a hundred thousand. Factor in nuclear war and or industrial destruction of the environment before they establish themselves out in space, the number of E.T. quote S could be quite low. But even if the number is 50 or even less when we consider billions of years and what technologies we know are around the corner, AI, nanotechnologies and quantum computers, even if one extraterrestrial civilization had got as far as the exotic technologies noted above and established themselves out in space, they should have been able to populate the galaxy. I've been refraining from talking about the latest nanotech and quantum computing news. Sorry if my readership is innocent, but I've been wondering who my readership is lately. Assuming my readership has been using me for insider news on nanotech and quantum computers I can only tell you that I am NOT an insider. I get my news when everyone else. Sure I peruse the net and I am a longtime watcher of the scene. Other than that I don't give any kind of secret info. Whether you want to believe this qualification of whether I'm giving secret info or not, I do feel forced to talk about AI, nanotech and quantum computers a bit here. AI and nanotech kind of arose together. One could say chemistry is nanotech. But what say Richard Feynman and Eric Drexler the two main founders of nanotech mean is nanomanufacturing. The last term is my own as far as I know. I have curiously seen it used from time to time. Anyways what's meant by nanomanufacturing is making everything from nanoscale to macroscale objects to molecular precision. Molecular is the better term here because to say atomic precision is to suggest subatomic quantum scale. We're talking about getting every atom in a molecule or a macroscopic object in the right place. Molecular precision. Nanomanufacturing would be like a computer. Only instead of juggling bits and getting a picture on a screen or a printout, we're juggling atoms and getting a product. Two effects could allow this. One, a molecular scale robot. The small size allows rapid movements. The other effect would be massive parallelism. When, if they get nanomanufacturing to happen, they could recycle the industrial world. We would be in a revolution comparable to the Iron Age to the Bronze Age. We could make things to their scientific limits dictated by natural law. Things could be made anywhere from 10 to a thousand times greater in quality. But, it's AI that can really drive the nano world. AI-powered nano manufacturing could explore those limits of natural law. They can also make the amount of technological development so high as to be beyond human comprehension. The amount of engineering accomplished in a single day could dwarf all that came for the last so many hundreds of years, much less the thousands and even millions of years if you count the Australopithecine stone tools. But that's nothing or even further augmented by quantum computers. Quantum computers use quantum entanglement, a state so delicate, you need to work at zero degree temperatures and get rid of all vibrations to keep the quantum state from withering away. Quantum computers could make today's supercomputers look like Pascal's adding machine of the 1600s. The quantum computers can solve quantum chemistry and differential equations that are unsolvable today. Quantum entanglement can lead to quantum technologies beyond even computing. They can come up with artificial atoms and alternative chemistries. Instead of just relying on the periodic table properties, we can come up with alternative periodic tables. Already we have cloaking technology. We already have the ability to make refraction-free lenses. This allows our electron microscopes to see atoms. Where before, the laws of physics prohibited electron microscopes from seeing atoms. I'd like to point out a favorite science technology that doesn't get mentioned much. Chaotic dynamics. Researchers have figured out how to use strange attractors and or go from one of the system's strange attractor states to another. They can stabilize one of the possibly infinite behaviors of a chaotic system. They can do this for any medium, mechanical, electromagnetic, chemical. Point is, if an extraterrestrial intelligence established itself out in space and or established even one of the above technologies, establish one, and you could easily establish the others, they should have no problem with interstellar space travel. So, 
Where are they? Isaac Asimov once again doesn't mention Fermi's question but, he does ask where are they. He talks about interstellar distances and 20th century ideas of how to travel at light speed. His answer is impractical. He essentially says traveling at light speed no matter what method means running into many meteoroids and the smallest meteorite turns into nuclear blasts. I think this is almost certainly the pre-nanotechnology slash quantum computer era answer. But, this problem, running into even the smallest thing is too energetic, is still a problem in the ultra-high-tech world of nanotechnology and quantum computers. Certainly we don't see light speed ships zipping around through the cosmos. We should be able to see them. There's an idea of folding space. I forget the author's name, but it was noted that if one turns on this space drive and aims for a stellar system, well, you'd fry the star system you just space drove to. You'd have to turn it off pretty far from the star system. So far out, you'd probably have to take a few years going the rest of the way at much slower non-relativistic speeds. Isaac Asimov's answer is, whatever extraterrestrial intelligences are out there, haven't been able to get much further than a couple of light years. Output, 